to introduce myself to you. My name is Andrew Owino. Let's go straight into the message for this afternoon. You may have seen the title somewhere, Three Mistakes to Avoid in, or oh, you saw it. I know I walked back and I know there's a team that is also doing music in the next room and it's a bit close, so I just want to be sure that my voice can be heard all the way to the back by me hearing you repeat the title of the sermon with me, Three Mistakes to Avoid While in Campus. And let's pray before we get into the message. Heavenly Father, I ask that all instruments heavens can use will be deployed in this hour in the operations to deliver this message in its importance and simplicity. I ask that you will work and speak through me, and with me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was September 4th, 2005. I came from an underprivileged village, a promising boy, and uh, I came to the capital of Nairobi to study engineering. My, half, my eyes were bright, full of hopes, and I admired the tall buildings and the complex road networks, and even the sophisticated city. I just loved the city. It was a bit different from the village. Now, arriving in a modest bus, I quickly picked my bag and asked for direction from the nearest person who cared. His instructions were straight. He said, go straight to the end of this road, and you will find the university located at the end of the road. Now, that turned to be the most complex direction I ever received because it took me four hours to locate the University of Nairobi from the bus station. Afterwards, later, I learned that that should ordinarily take you 20 minutes. Now, that was my first challenge in transitioning to campus. The sons of the prophet also had their own challenges to deal with. In their school, it was called the School of the Prophets. I don't know <laughs> how it would have been named in our current naming today. But for a moment, I ask you to imagine with me reporting to a school or to your school, to your campus. And you are told that the VC last Friday was taken by a chariot of fire. And that he dropped his mantle and his coursework material to the dean and the dean has taken over. Now he's teaching the subject. The guy went to heaven. And now this dean is filled with a double portion of the Spirit of God. Now all in all, to be a student in the school of the prophet was not only challenging, but it was a matter of privilege. I like to think, take for example, the privilege of being taught by someone who is taught by God, who listens to God himself, who has the Spirit of God besides can you think of having a lecturer who can multiply oil? I was happy that some of your faculty was here. Think of being taught by a tutorial fellow who can heal the waters and make axe heads to float in the, from the waters. I wonder what you teach in a physics class. While the student learned more than holy office work, they learned useful trade. Some mechanical employments were around to keep their hands busy, but also to sustain them in the school. It was a good framework for scholarships so that none needed to worry about their stipends or their school fee. I would have wanted to be in such a school, I think, where revelation was an everyday manifestation and miracle was the practical lesson of every day. As a matter of fact, the lesson was not in strict periods of time or in narrow classrooms, but the lessons were also carried out in nature. Some random lessons of faith and providence, you know, the students learned to trust their counselors and their instructors, and they took them in their every circumstance of their training. After all, selection in these schools were competitive based on grades, character, diligence, intelligence, and even discipline, you would have smiled if you read the school's motto. It went something like this. To learn the will of God and man's duty towards God. Again, 
The common causes included law. Can you guess another one? Maybe they studied how to approach God in prayer. Sacred history. Exercising faith in God. How to listen and how to tune your ears to God. Some people took their majors in music. Now the schools of the prophets, though prestigious, with good learning, had some challenges. And these challenges are common to every school and campuses today. They also had narrow buildings. Now, I, I think you should have understood the smile on my face. I feel your building is narrow. And the challenges of these institutions can push students to make certain mistakes. Now, as we go through the school of life, sometimes the places where we dwell become narrow. And life presents us with the discomfort of maybe what does not supply all our needs. We feel the need to expand, the need to grow. That's why you've planted your feet when you left home to campus. My mind has remembered my high school teacher. They were one of the wisest teachers. I am not saying the ones who taught after were not wise. But they had a way of putting some points across. One of them said, which I understood at the end of the course, that you see, some of you, your fathers, have sold goats to teach sheep. Another one said, some of you have come to school to grow old. Well, I understood those statements at the end of school. <laughs> some, of those, uh, some of you don't get it. But we, need, we feel the need to expand. When you leave home and come to an educational institution like this, you feel the need to grow. We, as we pursue growth and expansion, we are bound to make mistakes as the students as students in our quest to grow. And in the same way, 2 Kings chapter 6, we read, there are three mistakes that I would like each of you to avoid. And if you are taking notes, maybe you can trail the notes out of 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, I read. The Bible says, And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us, or too small for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye, or you may go. You see, friends, the first mistake we want to avoid is not learning to manage our needs. That's the point I'd like you to think through, learning to manage our needs. My wife speaks of the shock she got when she joined campus from high school. Formerly, in her high school, it was one of those world-class high schools you would have wished to attend with large spaces. She had a whole room to herself, she says, and a lot more facility. Yet campus was a tiny room. Be, you know, it was crowded with many people in one room in the name of hostels, not to mention the foul restrooms. For a moment, she felt the disappointing squeeze that the sons of the prophets felt. And that's why they said, the place where we stay with you is too small, as I have read. It's true the schools of the prophet were not one of those most prestigious world-class learning institutions with big expansive facilities. No wonder the sons of the prophet felt the squeeze of these narrow buildings. I believe that it was, it's a good philosophy still, and it was then, that we need to keep growing and expanding in learning and in all faculties. In fact, we ought to be seeking to become more. Some of you ask, God, can you maybe take me away from this difficult circumstance? But I think we need to ask to become stronger, 
to become more. We ought to seek to become better. Don't ask that it becomes easier because God put in us a natural predisposition to growth. Nature in itself is expanding from small to large, a desire for improvement. However, we need to train the mind. We need to train the heart. Each of us, we can run into the mistake that these boys ran into by thinking that every small space needs to be expanded. Well, this is a lifelong lesson because we will never have enough and we will always be looking to satisfy some need or some emptiness in our life. One preacher said, God put in us a God-shaped vacuum in us that nothing can fill. Now, you see, my first problem is the sons of the prophet should have done this. They should have asked the prophet, what do you think, what is your counsel concerning our pressing need? Instead of hastily devising borrowing schemes to alleviate their discomfort. Well, I would like to pause here and be a little positive. I don't want to be mean to the sons of the prophet. I want to be a little practical and applaud them for their practical approach and thinking up a solution towards growth. Equally important is their good attitude. I would like to applaud that. They didn't philosophize. They didn't come to the prophet and say, you know, Karl Marx wrote and said, Thou shalt not dwell in small spaces. Seek ye big spaces. They didn't complain either. They didn't blame the system or taxes. But they were handsome. They kind of found a way to tell the prophet what to do. In their circumstance, they knew it was a narrow building. Similarly, as you listen to me, young friends, you need to seek practical ways of constant growth so that you are constantly expanding in all dimensions, physically, mentally, and emotionally. When solving scarcity problems, it is prudent to know what specifically needs changing. What kind of change do you need? Just like the sons of the prophet, they did not say, oh, the instructions are old. They didn't complain that the school syllabus was inadequate or inferior. It wasn't the food nor the fee structure, they went straight to the point and they said it is physical space. The space where we dwell, can I read that again? It says, all now, the place where we dwell with thee is too narrow. I kind of felt, felt maybe they had some measurement tape, I don't know. How did they decide it was narrow? But I think they measured it. They brought a practical solution to a practical problem they knew we needed this kind of beams to build this kind of a house. I think you need to manage your needs. And one of the best places to start in managing your needs, to avoid the mistake of not managing your needs, is measure your needs. You cannot manage what you cannot measure. That's still true. Therefore, Measure your needs in order to manage your needs. I don't know, what do you think out there? I think you should be able to measure them. However, as needs press, as difficulties arise, I ask you, avoid the mistakes of these young people. They made a mistake of not learning to manage their needs. Now I'm thinking in my mind that Compass will bring you to narrow financial days. There will be needs that are emotional, difficult emotional moments, frustrating academic calendars, the pressure of cuts and exams. Have you felt them? Those of you who are older, you know when you feel the uneasiness of loneliness and the need to have a boyfriend and a girlfriend, and one day you'll realize the place where you stay is too small, and you'll want your own space. Every day's provision might not come. I still remember in campus, there was a period of three weeks I subsisted on Uji every day, and that was all I had. Difficult needs. But before you go expanding, I ask you today, ask God's mind. Ask for counsel. Ask for his servants about the meaning of these narrow spaces and difficult times. You see, in God's schools, difficult financial times Small budgets and narrow spaces might be the best accounting lesson to augment your medical
course. You didn't get that. Should I repeat that? Therefore, I ask you today, fine-tune your appetites. Not everything you feel that needs to be eaten must be bought and brought to the mouth. Manage your needs. Is that clear? So that you learn to, to thirst only for those things that last. I was trying to get a alliteration there, but you didn't catch it. So let me put it in the way you understand. Fine-tune your appetite so that you thirst for things that satisfy. Calibrate and standardize your taste. Not everything you see people eating is to be eaten. Weigh the tendencies of the majority and be careful about the crowd for you can run into sin and ruin. Besides, Train your self-contentment, which is great gain against and upon godliness. Specifically, fit your needs into your provision. Let me pause here and add something, for some have taken this out of context. While you fit your needs into your provision, you must always study to supplement with reasonable extra earnings from honest hard work to expand. For if you only train yourself to fit in your provisions every day, you will not learn to grow. Someone will say, oh, I only work within my budget. While you do, as the month ends, increase the budget by working and by learning to profit. Make the best use of resources. Minimize waste. And budgets still work. Do they work in campus here? Budgets. Do you know things called budgets? I'm on the national budget. Do you do a budget before you start expenditure? You are not responding. I am talking to this audience and they are so quiet. Specifically, fit your needs into your provision. Not every lack or narrow space should lead us to borrowing and cutting down of trees. The already tough economic times should not be compounded by uneasiness and slavery of debt because the result is the axe head is at risk of sinking. And today I came to tell you Jesus wants to be your counselor when you feel a need, when there is difficulty. He wants to be your supplier of all your needs. He wants to keep you from anxiety. He wants to keep you from dissatisfaction, which makes a lot of us unhappy by wanting to Impress people until they are depressed. The truth is this. Nobody cares whether you wore the same suit last Sabbath to this Sabbath. Nobody cares. I came to tell you. You can trust Jesus that he will keep you in perfect, in perfect peace if you stay your mind upon him. Naturally, pray over your luck, but also pray over your needs and pray over your investment. We've come to a time where you can't even be sure that your academic pursuit will result into a commensurate remuneration when you leave school. And you must think through these things very well. But also I ask you, differentiate the difference, know the difference between your wants and your needs. I can give you an easy difference. Have you ever eaten a banana? How many can you eat in one sitting? Maybe four if you, are, if you have a big stomach. Four. When you eat a banana, you feel satisfied, right? That's one law of knowing. What is your need? For needs, when you satisfy it, you get satisfied. For want, you will never. You get more. It creates a capacity to want more. So you can start listing the things that you always look for and you keep upgrading and they'll never be enough. This wisdom should also apply to the needs of others around you. Moreover, consider also with wise eyes a keen observation. The result of the mistake of this young man. Many have followed after this young man in love for money and they have erred from the faith, piercing themselves through with many sorrows. I ask you, review any hasty or hasty suggestions of borrowing. Can I use a word you know? Fuliza. Fikiria kabla uja fuliza. Review before you go to the Jordan. Ask yourself, what is the object of the large building? Who influences the appetite? For you want her trench coat.
passport. But she didn't buy it. It was given by a sponsor. I hope this young man did not consult the greedy Gehazi to tell them that they need a big house because he had cheated Naaman wanting more gifts. You need to read this story in context. And he got himself leprosy around wanting so much more. At length, I ask you, friends, review the priority of expanding that building. If you read this chapter, the next day, these guys had a security problem. Have you read the story? The Assyrians were coming to take over this prophet's little house. Now, if you knew the next day you had a security attack, an army coming to attack you, would you expand your house or build a wall? Can I hear you out there? Priority. Priority. One of the best ways to manage your needs is to train your observations. Look around to see those who have made this fatal mistake when they miss graduation. Look at their lives when they have loved money and ended in heartaches. Look around when they cannot manage their emotions and they end up in toxic, miserable, wasteful relationships. I should be quoted for that. Let me repeat that. Watch around when people cannot manage their needs. Know why you need a boyfriend. It could be that your father was not there for you. Manage your needs, I came to ask you. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? On the other hand, also learn from those who have successfully managed their needs. You see, this prophet, Elisha, had learned how to abound in much and how to dwell in small houses without borrowing without discontentment. What an expertise I could have used. Elisha was much more than a person who had learned to manage his needs. He knew how to manage his networks. And this is the second mistake I don't want you to make in campus. Learn to manage your networks. You know the Bible says, I read again, and one said, be content. This is now verse 3. I pray thee, go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. Ah, you guys are not happy with that last part. I will go. Okay, let me read then the part that should impress you. And, uh, but, uh, okay, let me, let's see verse 4. I will go. So he went with them and they came to Jordan. And what did they do? They cut down wood. They cut down wood. I heard of a pastor who was invited by the president to state house. And it was a function. Then afterwards, the president and his presidential security was walking away. And because of the press of those men as they are protective of the president, they could not allow the pastor to walk near the president. After a short walk, the president looked around to find his special pastor guest. And he could not see him. He was blocked far away from his side. The president said, he is with me. And that worked the miracle. A way was open for the pastor to come and walk next to the president, even to the president's table. That was good company. You see, this project needed company, not only of the sons of the prophets, in crafting the solution, but they also needed company in cutting the trees. Further, they needed expertise in their company, to which one wise young man said, you are a prophet, you must be wise, come and go with us. Do you see it? And the prophet agreed to this request. The invitation to Jordan by one wise young man. Of course, the young men here are careful not to make the mistake of missing mentors and guides in their life. That's why they have in their company a man of influence, a man of experience to be with them. Still, this speaks to the law of networks that builds and adds to your net worth. After all, the mistake of ignoring guidance and not thinking about who forms our association is something I see every day. But you want to avoid that second mistake? Learn to manage your networks. In essence, this speaks not to the number of people around you, but the quality of people around you. To illustrate, I read the concept of influence scoring. You can go try this at home. Influence scoring. So you list six people, you constantly talk, you constantly spend a lot of time with, besides your inevitable family and roommates. So once you've listed them, you score them based on different parameters. Things that are important in your life, personal growth, piety, 
cleanliness, kama wanaoga, character, relationships, morals, then you start listing John Doe. That's the first friend. Then you give them on a score, scale of one to five. Now the one who scores highest benefits from what I call expanded influence. You create opportunity and more time. You deliberately spend more time with them so that they can influence you. You invite them to your plans as your advisors. And those who score low on that list, you know what to do. Now keep quality friends, friends, along your way of life, along your path of duty. That's how Naaman benefited by going with good company of brave servants on his chariots. Indeed, they were men of conscience. They were men who could call even the boss to a reasonable requirement of the prophet. In addition, the servants helped Naaman to lose his pride and to change his way and find his way to the Jordan for healing. They helped Naaman change his attitude. My question is, what attitude does your friends build of you? Woe unto him who adds to his chariots, psychophants, spineless, boneless men and women who cannot show him direction or correct him when he's going wrong. Soon you realize our need for people in every stage of life is inevitable. By the time you reach here, you have dressed in someone's dress which somebody made. You took breakfast which somebody cooked or brought to this city. There is a way that we can't ignore people. The toothpaste you made, you didn't manufacture your own. And so treat people with respect. As you go through school, learn the skill. Number one, manage your what? Can I hear you out there? Your needs. Number two, manage your, your influence. Manage your influence, the people around you. It's a skill of life's journey. The ability to treat people with dignity and adding to them Adding them to our life's journey is an excellent skill. So take some practical time today. Decide not only on where you're going, but who you are going with. They said, if you want to go fast, go alone. Finish for me. If you want to go far, I didn't hear you. You don't know. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with People, go with people. Now, good people for that matter. <laughs> Don't just go with people, right? Good people. Have mentors along the way. Someone who has walked your path. Men whose walking pace are your running pace. Someone will say, Don't take advice from anybody who you wouldn't change positions with. Now, Jesus is a worthy superlative companion. He is ready and willing to walk with us. The songwriter said, and he walks with me and he talks with me. He promises that he will be with us, Isaiah says, that he will walk with us and he will help us. Jesus is the silent companion that goes with us on our quest for knowledge, on our quest for growth, on our quest for more, and on our quest for expansion. He knows our experiences. He can feel our pain. When the shoes get narrow and the houses of our school pinch us, when disappointments arise, I think it's a fatal mistake to take this journey of life without God. What do you think? It would be worse if we went alone. But you want to go with quality people, and one of the best ways to calibrate your quality is to be with God. I would love a God who walks my path who has taken the path before and knows the intricacies of the path very well and has been tempted in all things and understands what I go through. He understands my weakness. Now that is good company. What do you think? The greatest company is the company of God and God's power. No wonder the presence of the prophet within this, uh, to this young man was not just good influence, but it ensured safeguard against disaster and that brings me to my last point today a mistake we must not make not to learn how to manage disaster difficulty and failure remind me the three mistakes you must avoid number one avoid learning to do what or you must learn to do what manage your needs number two you must manage your 
Now, number three, you must manage your difficulties. Manage your difficulties. Let me read. This is verse 6 now. Is that where we come? Let's come to verse 5. No, let, let me back up a little bit on verse 4. They went, so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down wood. I will read that, the next verses. I was just interested in these verses. Come with me to Jordan's riverside and see these muscled young men, you know, swinging their axe, cutting down the beams one after another. Listen to the echo of the blow of the axe across the river. And as one tree falls and the next one, they were busy doing with their might what their hands found to do. You know, the first way of managing difficulty, which you need to learn early, is to be a master of duty. Did you hear what I say? To be a master of duty, to be available at your post of responsibility. This will assure your planting in spring and it will confirm your harvesting in autumn. That's why the young men went to Jordan. Yes, this was their destination. It was their post of duty, like the watchmen being found at the gate doing that which they must do as a watchman's duty. They were not found swimming or distracted with planktons and fish in the river. They were cutting down trees. Do you hear what I say? We see that truthfulness to duty. And a thorough dispatch always counts the progress of any young man and it prepares us to overcome difficulty. Be sure, young men, to come to the Jordan of your classes. Cut down academic trees. I have seen people taking notes by taking photos. Friends, notes are not photos. Notes are written by hands. Cut down, finish for me, trees. You are not impressed with that part of the sermon. You want me to talk about the fish. I didn't prepare that, friends. Complete your assignments. Attend classes. Yes, some of you are too religious. So heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good. From morning, they are in a morning devotion. They don't go to class. I hope you understand what I mean. Remember that your first obligation is to be a student. And it's difficult to be diligent, but it pays. Good habits are hard to form, but they are easy to live with. Bad habits are easy to form, finish for me, but they are difficult to live with. But we do not say that those who are diligent, they will not meet difficulty. We read in verse 5 all the way to verse 7, as one, but as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where did it fall? Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it hither, and the iron did swim. Can you remember the last time you lost something valuable, yet it was borrowed? I'm sure this illustration cannot fail to come in your mind, in your own personal experience, how much anguish you felt losing something that does not belong to you. This is how the sons of the prophet felt. Herein is the heart of our final lesson from this young man, learning to manage failure, learning to manage difficulty, learning to manage misfortune. We can suspect that this axe head would represent any tool, any means that can help us to grow, to expand, to cut down trees. And therefore, the axe head falling into the water must represent any loss or difficulty that you will experience naturally in your path as you grow. Whether the axe head fell because of negligence or lack of expertise, I will not get into. Whether it was lack of maintenance, I will not tell you. Whether it was degradation, someday, somehow, we will face misfortune and our axe head will fall into the water. Learning to manage such is an important skill in life. Now, to manage loss, number one, we must assess the impact of the loss. The young men knew that the axe was borrowed. There are things you can't afford to lose. Borrowed things. 
Take a moment and think about borrowed things that are helpful to your growth. Your ability to quantify what is in your care will determine how you will be able to recover in an event of loss. That which is given to our care, anything put in your care must not be allowed to degrade, to break down, to get lost, to fall into the water because, finish for me, it was borrowed. Instead, we should give careful attention to improve anything that comes to your hand. And let me talk to anybody who will attempt to pick someone whom you have borrowed from their parents as a girlfriend. They must not fall into the water. You get the joke? You don't get it. Well, let me get back to my sermon. Instead, we should give careful attention to improve everything that is in our hands. Everything that comes in our contact. Our ability to improve them is an index of being able to use them to improve our lives. For how would the young men finish their work at the river if the axe head is Chinyamaji? You guys are so slow. <laughs> Value borrowed things appropriately and know its proper use. Take all responsibility for its care. Now the second thing you need to do is assess where the axe head fell. Ask yourself in this message, where did the rain start beating you? Can you even describe where you went off course? Who is the bad company you are keeping? What appetites have you gratified lavishly outside your budget? Do we even know the areas where we need mentorship? Do we know the attitudes that are changing? In essence, you should list areas where you have failed and areas that need improvement. We sometimes not realize, friends, that the time of life, the opportunity in school is borrowed. This weighty axe head is handled carelessly until it falls into the waters of peer pressure, only to be swept by the currents of time downstream. Then the graduation hour rushes and it comes and finds you unprepared for any man meaningful transition. You come to the end of your school life without any beam of trees to carry home from the academic forest. So you are unable to expand your humble narrow dwelling. If we will not learn from these three mistakes, we will sadly come to the end of life without an axe head nor with, or without a beam. The young men knew that they made a mistake in following every appetite suggested by their hearts. They needed to take counsel. Am I right? Today I ask you to avoid this mistake. Manage your what? Your needs. However, they were happy to have one among them, a prophet who walked with them and helped them. Therefore, they managed their network. Similarly, we too in our journey of life, as we seek to expand and to grow, as we seek to meet our needs, we must have a man by our side. His name is Jesus. He must stand by our work and lend us help when we are at a failure. This is someone who will assist us in right thinking. He will support us. He will correct our mistake. Let's give careful attention when we are at a loss. Take responsibility and respond quickly. And when you do, tell the prophet where it fell. I want to ask you today to reflect on your life's mistakes. The biggest blunder and loss in this life is to walk without God. Today is the first year's Sabbath welcoming. I want to welcome you to a walk with God. I benefited from that choice as I walked into campus. Invite Jesus to go with you, just like the young man invited Elisha. Elisha here represents the power of God who can restore our losses, who can recover our failures, who can cancel our debts, right? Did you see her, him canceling the debts of a woman who was in serious problems? You need to read that story. Jesus can forgive us, he can restore relationship. Elisha even restored those who are dead. Did you read that when he added salt to bitter poisonous waters, it was fit for human use? Even death in the pot, he reversed and neutralized. Jesus makes a point and a promise to us today that even the years that have been eaten by locusts, he can do what? He can restore. Because Jesus is able to perform a miracle of restoration even when we make those three mistakes. I ask you, my young friends, Go with Jesus. Go with Jesus. Let him be in your company 
every day. Invite him to your classwork. Let him come with you to your duty. He will lift you when you fall. He will hear you when you call. And where there is some sinking. Maybe the iron head is sinking. Or maybe the person himself is sinking. He can perform a miracle today and he can cause you to come above the water. He can return your life. He can return your vision. He's willing to help you. I am willing to open my heart to this Jesus. Is that something you'd ask him today? As this dear one sing this song sitting at the feet of Jesus, I ask you to think through why would you make these three mistakes? Yet today God asks you to evaluate. Don't just go answering to every need. Number two, think about how you deal with the influences around you and pick Jesus as your chief influence. And finally, I ask you, when there is a mistake, respond quickly by coming to Jesus. Don't walk alone. Don't drown alone. Point to him where it fell and he will come, uh, perform a miracle. I think he's a worthy company. Do you think so as well? The year was 2001 and a certain lady by the name Janelle had reported to duty. Janelle was an immigrant to the US from Trinidad and Tobago and that morning she went to work as was normal. However, things were different that day. They had the building shake and they became scared. Janelle and her friends started running down the stairs and as I ran down the stairs there was another explosion and the building came crumbling down. Janelle was stuck in between a rubble and one who had not learned how to pray that day she learned how to pray. She sat stuck with rubbles on her feet for several hours and all she could do was pray and sit at the feet of Jesus telling him all that she had ever wanted to say to a God she had no relationship with and after 27 hours a miracle happened a dog rescued Janelle from the rubble and doctors who told her that she would never walk again became surprised several years later. Janelle is actually still alive. Today she not only walks, but she runs. But looking back, she says the only reason why she's able to walk today is because she was able to sit at the feet of Jesus in very difficult times when her needs were more than what she could meet, when the difficulties were more than her strength could meet when death was imminent, when difficulty was around. She found strength to sit at the feet of Jesus and today she walks again.
today. Ask him to bless you, especially with his presence. Bless me, O oh my Savior, bless me. As I sit low at his feet, oh, look down in love upon me. Let me see thy face so Sweet, give me, Lord, the mind of Jesus. Make me holy as He is. May I prove I've been with Jesus, who is all my righteousness. blessing of your presence where we can sit where mortals can be so blessed to take the counsel not to rush to the Jordan rivers that we will learn to bring to you our needs that we will keep you as our best influence that will bring our failures before you I pray Lord that you will bless this audience even as we take our break for lunch Bring us back in the afternoon to again hear your word. And bless us with that which is our greatest need, which is your presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.